Good afternoon, everyone. Almost evening. Almost cocktail time, but not quite. Um, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here. I'm Sherry Gelden, director here at the Wexner Center. And um, it is really a joy for us to um, open our galleries this evening, um, to invite you all in to share in the treasures that are there. Um, and I simply want to say, on behalf of the staff and the board and the volunteers of the Wexner Center, we're back and we're thrilled to be back. Yeah. Um, and to that point, I also just want to express my thanks once again to everyone throughout the community, our friends and colleagues in the cultural sphere, our patrons and members and friends from across Columbus and well beyond. I just returned from the Museum Directors Conference in Los Angeles, um, where everyone um, sends their good wishes, their compassion, and their empathy. And uh, in fact, I, I think it's fair to say um, running through all of their minds was there but for the grace of God. So. Um, I know that uh, you all have been rooting for us, and we really appreciate it. Uh, but on to this evening. We couldn't be more thrilled to present Noah Purifoy Junk Dada to Columbus audiences in what will be uh, and is its only venue outside of Los Angeles, where um, the show is organized by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, I'm going to depart from my customary remarks just a little bit this evening, especially because you will be hearing from the curator of the exhibition, Franklin Sermons, um, who will be able to delve much more into the artist and the work specifically. So. Um, instead, but kind of using the lens of the Purifoy show as um, a, a kind of more kaleidoscopic view, I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, share a few perhaps more personal reflections. Um, first on the, the nature of, of how this kind of programming comes to be, secondly, on the kind of vagaries of the socio-political, economic, and cultural aspects of um, the so-called art world and its ever-shifting sort of beliefs and assertions, um, and of course, media recognition that's attendant thereto, or perhaps I should say media attention or neglect in some cases. Um, and then most importantly, 
Um, reflections on the, the truly persistent force of the authentic artistic voice, regardless of and well beyond tastes and trends. So first, as someone who grew up in Los Angeles, attended college there, cut my professional teeth at uh, what was then a nascent um, institution, now going strong, the Museum of Contemporary Art. The name Noah Purifoy was actually somewhat familiar to me even then. I knew he had somehow been involved with the iconic Watts Towers in Los Angeles. Um, I sort of knew about the Brockman Gallery, though I'm not sure in all honesty that I ever made my way there. And um, I had, though, met Noah Purifoy on an occasion or two, most likely during what was his long tenure on the California Council of the Arts. Um, of course I knew he was an artist, and um, I think it's also fair but unfortunate to say that in all of, all of my years in LA, I probably recall seeing his work in very small doses and very infrequently. I was also aware, of course, that he was part of a, a larger circle of artists from John Outerbridge to David Hammonds, Betty Saar, Ed Ruscha, his close friend, um, and Ed continues to be a huge champion of Purifoy's. Um, but most of the artists I've mentioned, and, and others too, um, somehow more readily found their way into that kind of canon of high art. Um, which, in other words, is that that is defined by leading museums and curators and galleries and collectors and, of course, critics. But it was not really until last year, um, when I happened to be in LA actually for completely different reasons, um, that I would experience the truly stunning scope and depth and breadth and and true brilliance of Noah Purifoy's work. Um, that while um, visiting the LA County Museum, my once upon a time crosstown rival, but no more. Um, and although that exhibition was not intended to travel, um, as I kind of wandered through the, the LACMA galleries, I couldn't help but imagine how spectacular those works would look uh, at the Wexner Center. And beyond that, couldn't imagine why on earth a show like that wouldn't be traveling. Um, Michael Govan, who is a longtime friend and colleague, the director at LACMA, was initially surprised by my inquiry. I think even he imagined um, that Noah Purifoy's work might have very limited appeal outside of the confines of, of Los Angeles, and happily we were able to persuade him otherwise. So that kind of brings me to my second point, which is an ever pervasive conundrum, really, about how we in the museum field um, go about, you know, sort of assigning value, as it were, or bestowing recognition. Um, how uh, we have been inexplicably slow to embrace some artists and their practices, even while championing others um, who are working in very similar modes and sometimes with similar intentions and driven by similar social forces. I think there has been a little bit of reluctance over the years to um, immediately embrace those artists who are also deeply invested in social practices, although, again, there are exceptions. And certainly that's true, or has been true, um, of artists of color as well. This is, of course, a far too complex subject and really an intransigent one to address this evening, but um, it nonetheless has been kind of um, roiling through my brain as we have been putting this exhibition together. And I think it's fair to say that the trajectory of, of Purifoy's life and work and reputation um, is certainly ripe for that kind of investigation. But let's instead turn to my third reflection, which um, is perhaps an overly optimistic notion that 
the authentic creative voice will prevail despite uh, trends and sometimes even countervailing forces. And I think in the case of, of Noah Purifoy, it's simply uncontestable. Um, here is someone who had a lifelong penchant for making art of other people's cast-offs and from the wreckage, truly the literal wreckage of urban rebellion. Um, and both mined and made art history as he went along. Um, I think you'll see as you wander through the galleries here that whether he was inhaling and absorbing uh, the fumes of Marcel Duchamp or Kurt Schwitters or uh, Joseph Cornell and, and other Dada's predecessors, whether he was subconsciously at that, at that time sort of channeling um, the Bay Area funk artists like Bruce Connor or Jay DeFeo. Uh, and I would even say perhaps whether consciously or not um, referencing the combines of, of Robert Rauschenberg, one can't possibly deem Noah Purifoy uh, derivative of anyone. He was not a copyist. Um, he was not a pilferer or a pirate. Um, he was sui generis, completely unique, um, incredibly artful in everything he touched, as you'll see. And he took an approach to assemblage that uh, I think, um, as this exhibition very beautifully shows, um, is, is finally and um, belatedly being recognized for the artistic achievement that it is. As always, um, the entire WEX staff has played a huge part in realizing everything that you will experience this evening and throughout the exhibition. So if you will allow me to just express my thanks particularly um, to our curator at large, Bill Horrigan, and our newly minted, though um, long-standing um, WEX veteran, Megan Cavanaugh, who is now our director of exhibitions management. Um, they've done an extraordinary job working in close collaboration, um, in this case with Dave Dickus, our senior preparator, uh, Mark Van Fleet, our registrar, and Lucy Zimmerman, curatorial assistant, I think and hope at least that you will agree that they've done a beautiful job. Our director of creative services, Erica Anderson, uh, designer, senior designer now, Brandon Baylog, editor Ryan Schaefer, and um, their entire crew worked their magic on all of the printed graphics, and of course, um, Shelly Casto and her team of educators are helping to bring this exhibition to further life um, and amplification through not only um, the augmented reality app that you will encounter in the galleries on, on iPad minis, um, but also through uh, various talks that will take place throughout the exhibition. Um, I also want to thank, as always, um, my deputy director, Jack Jackson, for his partnership in so many things. Our director of patron services, uh, newly minted and truly new to the Wexner Center, so um, this is her first foray for a Wexner opening, and she's already doing brilliantly. Um, Katie Lux, our Director of Development, uh, Christy Schettinger, and Director of Marketing and Communications, Arthur Rao Lindsay, who will absolutely, uh, he will be furious if I don't remind you all, or actually tell you all for the first time, uh, that we at the WEX have finally joined the wave of museums around the world, and we are allowing photography in our galleries Abiding, of course, <laughs> yes, go ahead, applaud, applaud. Um, we do need, of course, to abide by the restrictions of lenders because contrary to most museums who have a permanent collection, everything you see in the Wexner galleries is borrowed from a lender, whether it's a museum, um, a private collector, a foundation. And so in those instances where the lenders have imposed photography, restrictions, it's indicated on the labels. We ask that you respect um, those restrictions, but otherwise, have at it, Facebook, tweet, Instagram, and Viber away. I bet my staff didn't know I knew about Viber. <laughs> anyway, that's what happens when you hang out with 20-year-olds. 
So let me also just take a moment to thank our exhibition sponsors this evening. Um, the National Endowments for the Arts for as um, a principal sponsor for um, the County Museum's organization of the show. And uh, here in Columbus, uh, Cardinal Health Foundation, Puffin West, Alex and Renee Shoemate, who I believe are here with us somewhere, right there in front of my very eyes, and also Donna and Larry James. But now to provide the true expert perspective on Noah Purifoy, I am very pleased to bring to the stage um, a relatively new colleague, someone who's been in the museum field for a, a long time now, but who I have only just encountered personally for the first time. Uh, Franklin Sermons began his museum career as a curatorial assistant at MoMA PS1, then moved on to the renowned Manil Collection in Houston, Texas, where he was the curator of modern and contemporary art. Subsequently appointed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art as department head and curator of contemporary art, um, where he, of course, curated the Purifoy exhibition, but during his tenure there was also tapped uh, to be, I think, the third curator of the New Orleans uh, Biennial Prospect, it was called, um, in, I think that was in 2014. And just last fall, as he was putting the finishing touches on the Purifoy show, oh, I think I moved his, sorry. Uh, I'm almost done. Anyway, as he was putting the finishing touches on the Purifoy show, he was tapped to be the new director of the Perez Art Museum in Miami. So I am doubly um, delighted and honored to welcome him here today as a fellow director, Franklin. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Um, as Sherry said, we'll get to the drink soon. <clears throat> um, thank you, for, thank you, Sherry. I, I also want to thank Bill and Megan and Lucy and everybody on the staff here at the Wexner who has made this process um, so easy. And through the transition of actually uh, thinking about the exhibition here as a curator and now as a director, uh, a time that would not lend itself to it, it all being so seamless and easy, they made it that way. So thank you. And, and Sherry, thank you um, so much uh, for bringing the show here. I, I heard one day I was in my office, which is across the street from where our exhibition was in the Broad Building at LACMA, and I heard that, that Sherry had been in the galleries. and and heard that she had a good encounter with the work and was very hopeful um, for how that might go. And I am just ecstatic to be here and to see the exhibition here um, and really appreciative. And you will see and I think agree that uh, the show had to come here. Um, so I'm gonna try and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go through um, some installation shots from the way that we first conceived of the show in Los Angeles and sort of interweaved with a little bit of biography. Try and run through these images and then hopefully be able to have a little bit of a conversation. Um, it is uh, always such a treat to think of and to see the ways in which exhibitions change in different places. And um, I just I, I want to point again to Bill for the installation here, which is phenomenal. Um, it makes me it makes me see things in completely different ways, and to even think about Purifoy in different ways. So I, I would say that um, one of the the reasons why the exhibition came to fruition and picking up I think a little bit on that idea um, that Sherry raised of of there being um, a new reflection on, on a body of work or on uh, artists who are overlooked is that in many ways, uh, although you know, Michael Govan, our director at LACMA, was somebody who uh, knew of the work and had a particularly uh, interesting relationship to the work, 
uh, there were a lot of people, I think, in my conversations where if you didn't have the experience of being in Los Angeles, you didn't necessarily know the work. And uh, that was something that we thought about a lot in the process. And I think at a certain point, it seemed like the best way to go about the exhibition was not to think about what other iterations may look like. Allow someone else to take that, that job. Um, and just to think about our initial uh, exhibition installation. And so I, I, we started, and I say we, and I, I for, think of this as a very, very communal type of effort in many ways, is because, of course, I had a co-curator, Yael Lipschitz, who can't be here. Uh, she just had a child. And not only that, but Yael had a, a, a relationship to the Noah Purifoy Foundation, and I'm reminded, we're joined here tonight by Joe Lewis of the Noah Purifoy Foundation, um, which also links us to a woman named Sue Welsh, whose name you'll see in many instances in the, the labels in the galleries. So there was, throughout the time that we were, even before we were given the, the sort of uh, ability to move forward with the exhibition at LACMA, there was a team of people that were thinking about this and wanted to, to see it come to fruition. And so with the foundation and with those people, um, it made it all possible. I begin with this overall, this sort of overarching biographical image because I think at times it is um, important in these instances to bring forth uh, some of the artists and not only uh, in the work, but also you know, what that person looked like, what they did, what their life looked like. Which is why it's also nice to come down the steps and run squarely into Purifoy's face before you make your way into the gallery. Um, that said, the exhibition for me began on a very much a, a, a personal um, sort of uh, trajectory over time. I was an intern in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s at Studio Museum in Harlem in New York. And so part of my job was basically to just go through archives and clean up paper and, and look at um, artist files from old exhibitions. And in the course of doing that, of course, coming across the work of Noah Purifoy, who you'll see in the ephemera out there that he was in an exhibition at Studio Museum in 1971. Um, and immediately I was kind of struck by this sort of different figure, this kind of different character. It was not someone who was making paintings. This was a conversation that was clearly different from the artist that I was um, probably most exposed to on the East Coast. Artists like Jacob Lawrence, artists like Romer Bearden, um, even Bob Thompson. I mean, to think about artists who were steeped in a sort of New York tradition. And clearly he was coming out of somewhere else. And I just remember being struck by the work and it kind of being a name that always um, stayed with me. I didn't know anything about the desert. I had not been out there until we started working on the project. So it was a very much a distance kind of approach. My distance shrunk when I went to the Manil Collection in Houston in 2006. Um, and there you encounter the history of the curator Walter Hobbs, who was the founding director of the Manil Collection in 1987. And Walter grew up in, <clears throat> in Los Angeles. He had a very close relationship to uh, the Ahrensburg family, um, who some of you will know were one of the biggest collectors of, of modernism and, and European modernism uh, in this country. Most of their work was so far out, even in the 1940s for Los Angeles, that no curator could convince anybody to get behind the work and actually keep it in LA. So most of it went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I'm thinking of artists like Kurt Schwitters, artists like Marcel Duchamp. And because Walter Hopps had this relationship with them, he was one of the first organizers of their work in this country. 
So as a curator at the Pasadena Museum of Art in 1962, he did an exhibition with Marcel Duchamp, first big show that there was of his work here. Uh, in 1964, he did a big exhibition on Kurt Schwitters. Uh, you, 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 you can think about our title of Junk Dada and to think about Schwitters and the relationship to Dadaism, to Surrealism. So there were these exhibitions that were happening in LA thanks to him. Um, being at the Manil Collection, I was charged with trying to think through Walter Hobbes' work all the time. Because it was, is, is how do you build off of, of this legacy, which was very much based in a, a collection that was formed in Europe and formed by uh, the peers of the founders of the museum. Uh, it was a collection that is known for being the largest in this country of Rene Magritte, of Max Ernst. So how do you think through that trajectory? And one of the ways that Walter did was that he felt like there was something that he always had to add on to that conversation. So thinking about an artist who's based in Dadaism and Surrealism, I think he was very easy for him to see the relationships in an artist like Noah Purifoy, somebody who's using found material, somebody who's using detritus, somebody who's using and thinking about art not only as an art object, but as a tool for a much larger discussion. Um, so, so there was work within the collection and there was this sort of history to be mined. Um, another reason why we are here is because of the Getty Initiative Pacific Standard Time. And they're coming up on the next iteration in 2017, uh, which will be dedicated to, to looking at Latin America vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Southern California. The first one was one in which the work happens, the kind of work that, that, that was alluded to in thinking about shining a new light on certain artists or taking a look back at certain artists. And so that exhibition set out to be a survey between 1940 and 1970, and in effect brought to light a lot of artists who were not considered a part of that conversation all the time. Um, Noah Purifoy appeared in something like five or six different exhibitions throughout the scope of that, that entire project, and one of them was a show called Now Dig This, which was done by uh, the curator Kelly Jones. And in Kelly Jones's exhibition, she decided to look very specifically at a history that grew up around, say, Brockman Gallery, one that was uh, important in the 1960s, particularly to artists of color. And Purifoy was a big, big, big part of that show. Uh, she gave me the opportunity to write about um, Walter Hopps in that catalog and to think about certain linkages between his work and the work of Purifoy. So that is kind of a, an entry point for myself. Uh, this is an installation shot from uh, her exhibition where you see work, uh, one piece in the back that you have here in the galleries uh, on the right, which is owned by uh, John Outerbridge. And then you also have work in the foreground that is made by John Outerbridge. This image here is from an exhibition that Yael did at the gallery L&M. And you'll see two pieces on the right side, just before the door, uh, hung high, that are now in the galleries here. And uh, she included these works in a group exhibition that was about Ray Bradbury and his influence on this part of Venice, California. Um, so it was a way of, I think, talking about Purifoy in a completely different context than it, you know, than would be, say, in Pacific Standard Time with the backdrop of Los Angeles. Now dig this with the backdrop of artists of color in Los Angeles. But one that sort of plucked him out and put him into a bigger uh, sphere. And, and so that was the, the, the coming together for me and working with Yael was that we were both coming from very different places. I, unlike Sherry, unlike Joe, I never met Noah Purifoy. It was always this sort of distanced um, approach to the work. And really, as you see, coming to it almost through uh, the eyes of another curator. 
But my co-curator had a special relationship uh, and knew Purifoy and interviewed him, did her graduate thesis on him at UCLA. So had, was coming with this, this wealth of, of information and knowledge that was um, incredible and I think quite complimentary. So working together is, is how this exhibition came about and I think um, it could have been done in different ways by each of us individually, but I think we got the most out of it um, together. Um, thinking about biography, thinking about, and it comes out in the work, it comes out in many ways, um, dealing with an artist who was born in Alabama in 1917, so very much a segregated Alabama. Um, he, uh, he kind of had two migrations in a way, uh, going from uh, Alabama to Ohio as a 12 year old, which was the other reason why I was like, this exhibition must come here. Uh, you know, his, his family moved there in 1929. Um, he returned to Cleveland as a social worker in the late 40s after his uh, experiences in school, after obtaining uh, a degree in social work at Alabama State, um, after being in uh, the Navy and uh, seeing Los Angeles as he was based on the Pacific. But we're talking about someone who had, I think, a wealth of experiences, uh, especially for someone at that time. And coming to Los Angeles, uh, after working as a social worker in Cleveland, uh, Purifoy went to LA in 1954 and, and, and graduated from Chouinard in 1956. Um, his, I think there's this conversation and this push-pull. There, there are a lot of different, I think, binaries within the work. Um, and going back to think about the title of Junk Dada is one big one, obviously. Uh, referencing a childhood in Alabama and I think, for me, thinking about reference points to traditions of art making in this country that are uh, specific to the American South. Um, to think about the ways in which Purifoy may have encountered quote unquote visual art as a youth, not in the museum that he would not have been allowed to go to, but in seeing craft in seeing um, probably quilting, which is something that I think you see very readily in the work. There is a history around working with wood that is uh, something that he would have been exposed to and I believe learned a lot from. And then of course the, the reference to Dada and, and to that, that other past that he studied as a student in Los Angeles. Um, after graduating and in the 50s and not necessarily being a part of, of, of the group that would become so well known at uh, the Ferris Art Gallery, people like Robert Irwin, Ken Price, Ed Keenholz, um, uh, we could go on. Uh, he, he was not a part of that conversation. He was not a part of it aesthetically. He was not a part of it uh, in, any, in any way. And I think in some ways, you know, like an artist like Betty Saar, who also went into commercial um, work and work that dealt with aspects of craft and work that could be sold and thus needed to be utilitarian, he had a very different path and one that I think relates back to um, that upbringing that might have said to uh, an artist like Purifoy that the work must do something. It can't just be just an object. It has to do something for someone. And so he made these objects like that, that hi-fi cabinet that you see there and like some of the, the works in the uh, bottom image and was part of an interior design team and was able to make a living uh, doing that while making art. Um, Jumping into our installation, we began with, I think, two entry points. 
And I should say that, uh, in a way, this is the third iteration of the exhibition because we started off with a large exhibition that covered the entire third floor of the Broad uh, Contemporary Art Museum at LACMA, which was approximately 18,000 feet. And way bigger than, than any traveling exhibition would be. Uh, but it was an opportunity for a few months to see it in this fashion. And so we sort of conceived of the exhibition as having two entry points. And one is, uh, I think, beautifully picked up um, here, where you have a chronological beginning with the work from 1958. And I'm not going to worry that this isn't the greatest image because you have the piece right there. But at the wooden headboard I'm thinking of on the right. And to think about that as the first piece was but one entry point. The other thing that you'll see in the overall installation, I think here at LACMA and here, is that it is not a sort of linear progression. That there is a point where Purifoy is able to define his materials and understand exactly what he wants to do. And conceptually, he moves onward from that point. There are changes and manipulations, but he knows exactly what he wants to do. Um, the work from 1958 is, is a, a headboard, a headboard that was used, a headboard that had value as something else. It was something that um, we were able to, uh, to use in the exhibition because it was something that was in the house where he was when he passed. It was something that um, related specifically to that earlier work. And we were not, as you can see, there are, there are passages where you know, that's the only piece from then. And so there are these, these breaks in time. And part of that, I think, is suggestive of the fact that he was making work that was meant to be used, that was meant to be sold and used by someone else and not necessarily thought of in the way that we think of, of the later works that we have on view. Um, to the left of the headboard is uh, the 1989 piece called Joshua Tree. And in some ways, you know, you can think about quilting, you can think about the sort of uh, way that he breaks up the, the, the plane of, of the painting, um, the way that he uses color as these sort of lozenges within the piece. It also happens to be, and I think it becomes apparent when you get to um, later in the exhibition and you see a piece that was created around the same time called Snow Hill. And, and you can see how both of these works are essentially abstracted topographical maps. So we began there. We began with a nod to chronology, but then also you're looking at a piece that is next to a work that's from, what, 28 years later. And those kind of things, I think, happen throughout the exhibition. It happens here as well. Um, a little bit of a better view of the Joshua Tree piece. And next to Lace Curtain, you get this idea of accumulation of a painterly style um, that also is very specific. Um, one of the things that, that also, in thinking about Purifoy and thinking about this time period, is his relationship to abstraction. And I think this belief in the power of materials to do as much as any representational image. On the other side, completely on the other side of the galleries, we started off with this piece, which also you have um, here uh, towards the uh, middle portion of the exhibition. And, and this piece is called Sir Watts II. It is, it is called a second because it was actually uh, a remake of the original piece that he made for 66 Signs of Neon, a, that body of work that is probably um, so important to how we can even think about the work from moving forward from that point in the 60s. It was remade for a survey exhibition at the Oakland Museum in 1989. And this is coming further into the room. So along with the headboard, thinking about uh, his relationship to wood, to craft again, with a whole body of work that is from 1988 and is right before he makes this break, um, leaving Los Angeles to go out to Joshua Tree. 
you can see how he's using wood again and using it in a very malleable way. Uh, and, and obviously, I mean, they, they come uh, alive in the galleries. But I think the thing that I love about this, this room and sort of beginning in this way is that to disrupt this idea of anything linear, to get it out of the way in a way. We moved further into the space. Um, and on the left, you have uh, another topographical map, more abstract. And then you have an office chair piece, which you also have here. And I think the thing that comes about with this work is how Purifoy begins to personalize the abstracted material. Um, also, there is the Last Supper. <clears throat> One of the things that we emphasize later is this relationship to music, our relationship to popular culture and to um, sound. Purifoy grew up with music around him. You have a piece dedicated to Earl Father Hines. You have two pieces on the right, Rags and Old Iron, that come specifically from uh, two uh, Nina Simone songs. And so there are all of these relationships where we wanted to pull out that conversation as well and to talk about Purifoy not only as this singular sort of artist, but as somebody who was part of a wider conversation. Um, likewise, that continues in this gallery. And then for Lady Bird, a piece that is dedicated as much to Billie Holiday as to Lady Bird Johnson, thinking through politics, thinking through popular culture, and ways of um, examining the work outside of just Purifoy. We came on into another space where you had uh, works that were made at Joshua Tree and works that were made with fire. Um, something that you see throughout his oeuvre. And we're going to come around to uh, some of the pieces that relate to 66 Signs. And feel free uh, I, I, if you have questions. Um, the third gallery for us at LACMA was one where these pieces of collage, pieces of accumulation, um, really came together. Out in the desert, he was allowed to put materials together and to archive material. The process of getting material was one where it was easy for him to get it from recycling. Uh, he was able to um, to live in a different way uh, from the experience in Los Angeles, where it was more about picking through detritus. It was this process was more about recycled materials. And we came around in this gallery. I'm just going to try and get through some of these images. Um, the 1967 piece from Washington brings us back to that experience with Walter Hopps. Um, 66 Signs of Neon traveled to Washington in 1969, and this piece came into the collection there in DC uh, short, around that time. Um, one of the things in thinking through the trajectory is the influence of Watts Towers, and you've, it's done so well uh, in the installation here where you have that photo mural on your way into the second gallery. One of the things that I think is, you know, in thinking about that vernacular history of Alabama mixed with somebody who went to school at Chenard, somebody who was in conversation with Walter Hopps, is that in 1964, uh, Purifoy becomes the director of the Watts Towers Art Center. So he's working in the shadow of Simon Rodia's Watts Towers every single day. He's looking at the accumulation of bottle caps, of shards of glass that Rodia used to make the towers. The towers were made between 1921 and 1954, like an incredibly uh, intense period of time and one that is somewhat mirrored, I believe, in the experience that Purifoy shows us later when he goes out to the desert and works in a much more secluded fashion 
almost to make a work that does a similar thing, that becomes a destination, that becomes a, a sort of total artwork. And I think that harks back to you know, that relationship to Dadaism, that relationship to thinking about the Bauhaus that, again, fits with his relationship to vernacular art, that the art must do something. So Rodia referred to uh, the towers as uh, our place, and, and there was always this sort of communal or collective uh, directive um, to that space. So for Purifoy, social worker trained in school, uh, to be able to have the aesthetic, I think, of the towers, and then to think about the sort of marriage. And it's, it's, it's something that um, you know, comes about in bits and pieces and looking at the work. But that marriage of social work and wanting to be an artist who could make work that would fit into a wider conversation was something that was always there and was something that he always dealt with. Um, I think for us in many ways it was something that he, he, I'm not so sure that there was ever a point in time where he would say that he successfully dealt with that conundrum. Um, wanting to help people and wanting to use art as a tool to have that conversation, but at the same time, I think desiring to be able to just make work in a world where perhaps it wasn't so necessary for him to do all of the other things. And this happens um, in a period of time when we're talking about civil rights, when we're talking about uh, all of these different changes uh, in this country. Purifoy remembering having a very acute sense of race, of civil rights, coming from Alabama, um, leaving Alabama, being in Ohio, and then being in Los Angeles, and being very aware of how people are treating each other. Um, of course, so in 1964, teaching kids, as you see here, um, in ever other reference points to the idea of the towers and the art center being this place where people come together, where art sparks conversation, where it might lead to uh, something better. Um, but, of course, he's there at the Watts Towers in 1965 when the Watts Rebellion happens. So he's watching all of this from that standpoint. And sees the destruction and I think is, is in a way um, disappointed uh, or beyond disappointment and, and I think also sort of goes toward uh, decreasing his sort of optimism around the power of art and what art can do. So in the years around that time and immediately after, he turns much more towards a more activist um, practice, which leads us to, uh, to two specific things that happen in that period. I think there's the arts and education aspect, then there is the reaction to Watts, uh, specifically in Signs of Neon, and then five, sort of five or six years later, we get to uh, an exhibition that he created at the Brockman Gallery in 1971, which there are these photographs that are, are on the wall on the right, which we see better here. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are many reactions uh, to that time period, and I'm thinking of, of people like Via Selman's uh, painting Time Magazine's cover from 1965, uh, thinking of Mark de Suvro doing the protest tower in 1966. There are many specific reactions, but I think there is no specific reaction to that moment that is greater than signs of neon. And essentially, Noah Purifoy saying to his friends and fellow artists, come with me into uh, the rubble of what has happened and let's try to make something out of it. Let's try and make something positive uh, out of this destruction. And you know, the pieces that we have here are those that have survived. The exhibition or group of works comprised 
around 66 different objects and traveled for three years, including that time uh, in Washington. And really, uh, I think in many ways, served to put Purifoy out there in terms of an art historical conversation that was way beyond Los Angeles. Um, this is also in the run up to uh, so many of the exhibitions that happened in this country as a reaction to the civil rights movement by 1971. So uh, hard to make here, but there's a, there's a brochure within uh, this vitrine that is showing his presence in an exhibition in New York around that time. Uh, there, are, there are references to Brockman Gallery. Um, and so there, are, there is obviously, I think, this budding sort of conversation that he's a part of and that is coming to fruition. So if he did not have the same opportunities coming out of school in the 1950s as uh, some of the artists we would associate with Ferris, and, and very few did, um, there was a moment uh, in the 60s where things were very much different. Um, I'm also reminded of, of Purifoy um, being born in 1917, was born a year before the artist Charles White. And Charles White was teaching uh, at Otis and was an artist who was very much about the representational image, was very much about images of uplift. And, and, and there's that, that duality between abstraction and representation that is constantly um, in Purifoy's, I think, desire to make work that made a difference without making something that was totally representational. The closest he gets, sorry, The closest he gets is the um, images from 1971. And I am just going to go back to here. Um, so at this point, 66 Signs of Neon has traveled. There is this space of conversation in LA that is um, much more uh, open to his work, that is much more receptive to his work that is part of a conversation with other artists who are also looking at um, uh, themes around civil rights. Um, but for Purifoy, I think in the wake of, of Watts and after 66 Signs of Neon, you see another one of those periods of time where he's not creating as much work, where he does turn to the uh, workshops and he does turn to working with kids. But in 1971, he made this exhibition at the Brockman Gallery, and he made it as a way of demonstrating in a quite representational way uh, the effects of poverty, the effects of oppression. And so what you see in those photographs that are here uh, are images from that show. And we cannot recreate the installation of that exhibition, which included a uh, refrigerator with spoiling food coming out of it, uh, this total sort of environment of poverty. Um, there is a piece where you can see uh, uh, how people live on top of each other. And you see this uh, just in these images, which were documentary images from the exhibition. Uh, so there is this turn to something quite different, I think, from the artists um, that we most associate. Uh, with his work. And this leads into a period shortly after where he really uh, stops making work for a period of time, which is something obviously you see uh, in the galleries. This period between 74 and 87 where he's working for the California Arts Council, um, thinking that the best way to be effective is to serve on the council and hopefully put funds in the hands of artists and organizations who are making a progressive difference. Um, we came through a, a sort of passage gallery uh, to get to um, some of the larger uh, works that you see coming up. Um, a work like this and thinking about uh, how there is a completely different um, thrust to the work when he is out in Joshua Tree. Um, Purifoy's work at that time 
uh, you see how he's able to use the expanse of being outside, obviously the larger outdoor pieces, which clearly um, don't travel so well, but we end on the perfect note with uh, the spaceman upstairs. Um, but this ability to work with, with material, and this is 20 years later. This is a period where there is almost a, um, until his it's passing in 2004, is this sustained conversation on art and abstraction, on outdoor art, uh, thinking about the uh, desert as being a sort of collaborator with the work. Um, going in and out of the desert, you see how uh, a piece that was red two months ago is pink um, when you're looking at it now, and how much the elements play a role in sort of changing the patina of everything out there. Uh, and a little bit of better view of skis in the desert. Um, not sure why they were there, but him finding these things and being able to put them to use, I think, is, is part of the, the conversation that you see from the very beginning. There is a, a wall where you have uh, a piece from 1967, you know, the big accumulation piece from Washington. Uh, we had that piece next to Access, which is the work that is at the entrance to the exhibition here, which is from 1993. And so you're looking at the piece from 67 and the piece from 93, and clearly this person knew exactly what he wanted to do in terms of an aesthetic, in terms of a way of working from a, for a very long period of time. And I think that essentially that, that continues um, with the larger work, with this idea of making something out of um, the material at hand. And we came around to that great photo uh, mural that you have uh, here. This is a piece called For the Little People. Um, I think it, it can be a quite playful and, and humorous look, uh, but also I think goes uh, quite the other way as well. Uh, there's another piece that I remember seeing out in the desert near this piece, uh, which is a, a sort of scaffolding um, that re also relates to uh, uh, almost a structure for hanging. Uh, so there is this constant push-pull, I think, between a sort of seductive, um, and humorous play with materials in something that is, is much deeper. Um, coming back around to uh, the 1965, and there you see uh, Sir Watts II from 96, the remake of, of the original piece and a couple of the photo mural pieces that we used. I think it's, and, and, and here we are. Uh, the V. S. Elman's uh, magazine cover from 1965, and the Mark de Suvero protest tower. Um, Selman's an artist who was making work and, and studying at UCLA in the same period, and of course known for much more representational images, and also someone who I think dealt with uh, uh, not being um, not having a gallery system so receptive to her as a woman at that time as she, she would have liked. And of course, Via ends up going to New York City uh, and staying there rather than, um, that, rather than being one of those artists who continues to be associated with Los Angeles. Um, the DeSouvero, also reminiscent uh, of that moment. And, and we sort of in a way ended or created another beginning with um, the room of works from 66 Signs of Neon. It's so nice to, like you can see how they're in this very confined space here 
uh, so nice to be able to see them in a more open way upstairs and and um, to see the, the the sort of way that they interact more with the other works from from much later. We did not have that at all, obviously. Um, I think that interesting thing for me within those spaces is how you see three works that are on the pedestals uh, with the plastic, with the plexi boxes, and how much they are also reflective of a conversation that was happening in Los Angeles around that time with artists like Fred Eversley, Dwayne Valentine, uh, Robert Irwin, who are, are much more associated with what would be called light and space, and how plastics and the aerospace industry really led to uh, an aesthetic of, of visual art that was unique to Southern California. And so Purifoy was also a part of that conversation. I mean, there were these three pieces uh, between 64 and 65, and they were all acquired by uh, the same collector. And uh, it was a, a man in Pasadena who also had a reference point to uh, Alabama, to being in Tuskegee. And so there are these, these sort of um, these pockets of stories around um, the different works uh, that are in private collections. And obviously with a show like this and dealing with so many uh, things that didn't exist from, from that period of time, uh, it was and has been so incredibly fascinating uh, dealing with, well, how was the work disseminated? And, and that was one of the rare cases where three pieces went to one person who had this relationship. He actually worked for a, um, a large chemical company, so it was part of that uh, aesthetic. The work here is by Judson Powell, and, um, and behind it is a work by Debbie Brewer, so also suggestive of how much 66 Signs was a collaborative effort. It was never intended to be just um, Purifoy, but it was really about uh, people working together and, and better views of some of those great works. <clears throat> and, and of course the, the great piece from 1967. So we kind of ended there and had a couple of pieces um, outside. Obviously, being two hours from, um, from the desert made that easy uh, in a way that it's not easy to truck things from Los Angeles to Ohio. Uh, but to come in and see the work and see it with the, 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 the photo murals has just been a phenomenal um, experience. And again, those reference points and the, the way that his biography relates to um, Ohio. Um, i just so thankful for uh, the show coming here. And I think you know, Joe would uh, agree with me in saying that, that Noah would be happy. So I hope so. And thank you. Happy to take questions. <laughs> So before Franklin takes any questions that you may have, and in the spirit of these things always having a kind of organic and sometimes circular life, um, I thought many of you who will recall um, maybe four years ago our exhibition of Mark Bradford, who has since gone on to kind of uh, that stellar status, um, is still working, making work in Los Angeles. But when I was there just last week, um, I visited what had been his studio in the Lemert Park area of Los Angeles, which is exactly where the Brockman Gallery was. And Mark has decamped doing his work now in another venue entirely and has turned his studio, I think, very much in the spirit of what Noah Purifoy was doing into a community space for kids, teens, adults, workshops, hands-on, um, very much focused on foster kids in particular. 
Um, and I also have to think that Noah Purifoy would really appreciate that as well. So somehow or other, these things all come together. Yes. Yeah. And you're reminding me. The, the other interesting connection with Ohio was the influence on him of Carmel House in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And again, that same reiteration of art is more than an object. It is this thing that has, um, you know, Life. Yeah, a life and, and, and touches people and does something for people. Uh, and so in addition to Mark, we have the Astor Gates' work in Chicago, which I think is very much in line with. Um, Tyree Guyton in Detroit this has a lot of sensibilities with that work as well. And Amina Robinson. Amina right? Robinson here, here. Robinson. absolutely. Um, yeah. So. No, it's, it's, it's crazy. So, any questions, um, or are you all now keen to go see that work for yourself? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, Anne. Um, we, uh, I had, I had, I went, I had a vision in my head from the very beginning of how that would work only because I had a speci very specific experience. There was a, a large sculpture by, um, by Max Ernst that was displayed at the Manil Collection that used a sort of sandbox. And, and it was up there for about six months. And I just, I never, I never forgot it and felt like aesthetically that was a good time. What you will also see here is that any of the works that live as um, in domestic settings uh, are, on, um, are on platforms. So we wanted to suggest that they had a life that was different from their life in the desert. Like the spaceman, for instance, would have been seen out there. I've seen images of it out there on the ground. But here it's displayed on a pedestal because it actually lives in someone's house on a pedestal. Um, likewise with uh, the ski piece. Uh, but that was a, it was an interesting conversation the whole way and exhibition design and are people going to track it through the galleries? Um, we actually used a, a spray material to fix the um, gravel material. And we also reflected it by using exactly the same material outside. Thank you.